I'm going to go ahead and kneel and pray up here. If you would go ahead and, and bow your heads. I feel it is very important that we ask the Holy Spirit to be here with us. You know, spiritual things are spiritually discerned. And we need God to come in here to speak to our hearts, okay? Go ahead and bow your heads with me as I pray. Father, we just thank you for bringing us together this evening. We thank you for the, just for the, the ability to come together, the freedoms that we have in this country, that we can come together to study your word. And Father, tonight we have come together because we're seeking truth. We don't want just any truth, Father. We want your truth. And so, Lord, this evening as I, as I go through Scripture, as I present the word, Lord, I pray that you'd be with me, that only truth would come forth from my lips. Father, I pray that your Holy Spirit would fill this place. You'd fill our hearts and our minds, that you would draw us especially close to you. Father, please bless us with your presence now. May we come out of this room tonight closer to you than when we walked in, I pray. In Jesus' name, amen. Our subject this evening, as the screen says, Prophecies, Final Countdown. <clears throat> story is told about two men who are standing on a street, and they're watching two men on the other side of the street. Each of those men were carrying a sign. One sign read, the world is about to end. The other guy's sign said, the world will never end. You know, that seems to be the modern dilemma that we're living in, isn't it? You know, for every expert who speaks about the pending doom of planet Earth, there's another equally academically and technologically trained who tries to argue convincingly that the future never looked any brighter. So who do we believe? You know, who really knows the answer of what the future holds? I want to share with you a few quotes from some so-called experts from the past. I think you'll get a kick out of some of these. This is from Dionysius Lardner. He was a, a scientist and a mathematician back in 1823. And here he said that rail travel at high speed is not possible because passengers unable to breathe would die of asphyxia. I wonder what he would think of the high speed rail that they have like in places like Japan. Pierre Pache, professor of physiology at Toulouse in 1872, he said, Louis Pasteur's theory of germs is ridiculous fiction. How many of us have heard of germs? Have you heard of germs over the last two years? Yeah, especially over the last two years. Internal memo from Western Union in 1876 says, this telephone has too many shortcomings to be seriously considered as a means of communication. This device is inherently of what? No value to us. Now, how many of you in this room tonight have a telephone? Probably in your purse or in your side or in your pocket. Yeah, we carry them all around with us. Lord Kelvin, you've heard of the Kelvin scale? It's a type of uh, measuring temperature. He was president of the Royal Society in 1895. He says, heavier than air flying machines are impossible. Don't tell that to Elon Musk. He won't believe it. <clears throat> Albert Einstein in 1895, he said it does, his teacher, he said, it doesn't matter what he does. He will never amount to anything. Well, he missed that one by a long shot. <clears throat> Charles H. Duell, Commissioner of U.S. Office of Patents in 1895. This, 1890, this one blows me away. He says, everything that can be invented has what? Has been invented in 1899. <clears throat> New York Times in 1939 said, the problem with television is that people must sit and keep their eyes glued on a screen. The average family hasn't time for it. I was in a restaurant the other day, and it wasn't a TV screen. It was a smartphone screen, and it was a husband and a wife, or, or boyfriend and girlfriend. It was a man and a woman. I'll just leave it at that, because you couldn't tell, because all, they never even talked. They were both on their, on their phones. Well, I don't know if they were texting each other or texting somebody else or email or whatever. Just some statistics to show you how off this was. According to A.C. Nielsen Company, the average American watches more than four hours of television every day, or 28 hours a week, or two months, think about this, two months of nonstop TV watching per year. You wouldn't think it'd add up to that much, would you? In a 65-year life, I'm going to give away something. I passed that mark a while ago. <clears throat> In a 65-year life, that person will have spent nine years glued to their television. Amazing. Thomas Watson, chairman of IBM in 1943, he says, I think there is a world market for maybe five computers. 
I would dare say more homes have more than five computers, especially if you look at, you know the smartphones we have today are actually more powerful than the computers that they used to put man on the moon. Yeah, it's amazing. In fact, the first computer that I got, my smartphone, oh my, it has 128 gigabyte of memory in it, and my first one had 210 megabyte. I have more RAM. I mean, it just, it's just amazing what happened. They really were off on that one. He, he was not a good one to listen to for investments. Ken Olson, president, chairman, and founder of Digital Equipment Corporation, 1977, he said, there is no reason anyone would want a computer in their home. You know, years ago, I was in construction, and I was in an office one morning. An engineering student was working summers in that, in that business, and uh, he came in. He says, you know, the day's coming where you're going to be able to control everything in your house from any place in the world. And I look and I said, I don't think so. I don't think so. He was right. He was right. You can do it today. <clears throat> Lee DeForest was a radio pioneer in 1957. He says, man will never reach the moon, regardless of all future scientific advances. You know, before the turn of the century, there was a great deal of speculation concerning the future, whether it was New Age gurus or, the, or even Bible, Bible prognos prog uh, prognosticators. I'm getting tongue-tied up here, and that doesn't often happen. Lots of forecasts have been spread around the world telling what's going to be taking place. In fact, just a few years ago, many of you can remember when Y2K happened. <clears throat> I met a guy out in California in 2000 in the fall of 2000, and he had told me that he, had, he thought everything was going to collapse in 2000. The whole world was going to come to a standstill because computers couldn't tell what time it is. Never stopped anything before, but anyways, that's what he thought. And so he had 10 years worth of food, 10 years worth of fuel. He bought a uh, mountaintop down in Arkansas, and he had everything set up in there like a fortress. And when I met him, you know what he was trying to do? Get rid of all this food. He was trying to find people to buy this from because he realized he wasn't going to need it. But there was a, 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 lot of, a lot of startling events of modern time took place. And during that time as well, millions of people developed a special interest in prophecy. And they were wondering, you know, what on earth is going to happen next? They began asking, you know, where in the world are we really headed? Well, it's no question. People ever are fascinated with the future. But you know why? Because that's where we're going to spend the rest of our lives. Some people like to spend it in the past, but the truth is we're spending it in the future. You know, some are, are curious about the uncertainty of the events currently unfolding in our world, and they have good cause to be concerned about what's happening. Many are desperately looking for answers to life's dilemma. So as we look around at a world that's in turmoil, intelligent thinking people ask themselves, you know, who is really in control? You know, what is really going on? What can we expect to happen? Is there really any way of actually knowing? And especially as we realize the enormity of the ever-increasing magnitude of world concerns, we may wonder, will there even be a next century? Will the world even exist in the future? You know, do we have a clue as to who is right? Well, there's good news is that there is no question about it because God doesn't play hide and seek with us. He shares his mind regarding the, fu regarding the future in his holy word, the Bible. Because no matter how many fears threaten our happiness and security, we can have peace, assurance, and hope based on genuine facts. The book of Daniel reveals much of this plan. In fact, speaking of Daniel's prediction, Jesus has something to say about that in Matthew chapter 24 and verse 15, where he says, spoken of by Daniel the prophet, whoever reads, let him understand. Now, he tells us about things spoken of by Daniel the prophet. Now, this word right here really specifically uh, refers to the issue called the abomination of desolation. Now, we're going to be talking about that in a future presentation. It's something we need to understand because Jesus tells us he must. But then he says, when you read what was spoken by Daniel the prophet, then he said, let him understand. And so we're instructed to understand the book of Daniel. And so if you want to understand end times... You see, you must understand Daniel's prophecies. If you want to understand the book of Revelation, you must understand Daniel's prophecies first. Daniel is the key that unlocks Revelation. In fact, Daniel is the source most alluded to in the book of Revelation. Well, in Daniel chapter 2, we find an ancient prophecy that predicted who would rule the world, how each ruler would actually rise and fall, and how our world would eventually end. 
It began when Daniel was alive on the earth, when a king dreamed of world events that spanned over 2,500 years of this earth's history. And folks, those events have come to pass with such precision that really only the hand of God could have been involved. It's a prophecy that proves beyond a shadow of a doubt that God is in control of history. In fact, it's a prophecy that's been almost totally fulfilled. Now, it's almost, but not quite. And when you look at back, back at over 2,000 years of prophecy that have been fulfilled, you can look ahead with assurance that the last bit, little bit that remains will be fulfilled according to the prophecy. And so the Bible clearly gives us hope for tomorrow, and it clearly reveals the plan of history. Now, here's something that we can have confidence in, something that we can be assured of. This is not idle speculation. And so tonight, as we draw back the curtain, we can see through the window of Bible prophecy and be informed. In fact, you can see clearly what will take place in the future of this world. And so before we allow Daniel to tell us his story, I'd like to share with you an amazing promise from God's holy word. And it's found in Amos chapter 3 and verse 7. Amos says, surely or absolutely the Lord God does what? He does nothing unless he reveals his secret to his servants or prophets. Now, Amos was not talking about if the stock market is going to go up or down. But he's talking about what's going to happen in a timeline of history, in a timeline of settling this issue that began so many years ago. The Apostle Peter echoes his assurance with these words in 2 Peter chapter 1 and verse 19. He said, And so we have the prophetic word confirmed, which you do well to heed as a light that shines in a dark place until the day dawns and the morning star rises in your hearts. You see, Peter is saying, listen, we see, we have seen, we have witnessed prophecy fulfilled we know that this is a fact. He says, and you can be sure of this as a light that shines in a dark place. Have you ever seen a bright light on a dark night? What happens? You're drawn to it, right? You're drawn to it. You're going to look at it, you know, because it, it, it's shining. What is that? What you're looking over? That's what Peter is saying. He says that the fulfillment of prophecy draws us into, until the day dawns, the morning star rises in your heart. He's talking about the second coming there of Jesus. And so we have this wonderful opportunity to learn what God has revealed to us for today. And so tonight, I want to take you to an ancient prophetic dream in Daniel, an amazing, thrilling prophecy that reveals over 2,500 years of history in advance. This prophecy in Daniel chapter 2 is, well, like what I said earlier, is a foundational prophecy for the study of end times. In fact, an understanding of this will prepare us to study the book of Revelation more thoroughly and completely. See, the books of Daniel and Revelation are companion volumes. They're kind of like the hand that fits in the glove. There's, there's, there's something that they work really, really closely together. And so tonight, let's start our journey by going to Daniel chapter 2. <clears throat> now, Daniel was a young man. If you want to follow along with your Bibles, go ahead and do it. As a young man, Daniel was taken captive when the Babylonians came to Jerusalem and captured the city. They conquered the city, and Daniel was about the first group that came over. Actually, Nebuchadnezzar made three trips over there. But on the first trip, he took a number of the, of the best of the best. He took the cream of the crop, those that were educated, those that looked like they would have the most promise, because they would bring them back over to Babylon, put them in the University of Babylon, teach them the Babylonian way so that they could put them back over to rule over their people as vassals for the Babylonian Empire. Now, ancient Babylon is located in the area that we call Iraq today. Now, I want to listen to what Daniel tells his story. Let's read Daniel chapter 2, verses 1 through 3. <clears throat> it says, Now, in the second year of Nebuchadnezzar's reign, Nebuchadnezzar had dreams, and his spirit was so troubled that his sleep left him. Then the king gave the command to call the magicians, the astrologers, the sorcerers, and the Chaldeans to tell the king his dream. So they came and stood before the king. And the king said to them, I've had a dream, and my spirit is anxious to know the dream. Now, Nebuchadnezzar was the king who ruled the great Babylonian empire from this massive walled city of Babylon more than 500 years before Christ. The city was built on both sides of the Euphrates River. In fact, the river flowed right through the city so that they had a constant supply of water. And there was a reason for that. I'll get to that in just a little bit. Now, just as a comparison, Babylon was about 10 miles around. Rome 
was about six miles around, and Athens was about four miles around. A very significant city in the ancient world. Babylon was located in an area of the world known as the Fertile Crescent, which had an intricate system of canals that irrigated lush croplands. Now, Nebuchadnezzar is a king who built a luxurious hanging gardens, which is one of the seven wonders of the ancient world. He was married. His wife grew up in a mountainous area. <clears throat> now, if you've ever seen Iraq or where Babylon was, it's as flat as a pancake. There's not hardly a ripple in the ground. And his wife missed her homeland. She missed the mountains of her home. So he built her a mountain, and he had it all terraced, and he had all those gardens and such on there. It was interesting. I was reading about the hanging gardens. What was interesting is that because of the irrigation, because of everything, it kept it cool inside, and so they were able to store things inside there. But there were flowers and fruit trees that would blossom. They were, they were watered by a very advanced system of of irrigation and drainage. At the center of Great Babylon, Nebuchadnezzar built a 300-foot shrine to the pagan god Marduk. Now, like I say, the, the temple of Marduk was 300 feet high. Outside, it was covered with glazed blue tile. Inside, it was overlaid with gold. He covered the walls and the roof of the building with gold. The altar was solid gold. In fact, <clears throat> archaeologists estimate Nebuchadnezzar used eight and a half tons of gold in building this in his shrine to Marduk. Now that's 204,000 troy ounces. Now I didn't do the math because gold goes up and down, but it's somewhere in around $1,950, right around nine, between $1,900 and $2,000 an ounce. And you take that times 204,000, there was a lot of gold there. There was one uh, rather creative archaeologist, he said that the very first thing that Nebuchadnezzar did every morning was to greet his subjects with a royal kiss. Where do they come up with this stuff? <laughs> you know, how well they know that? You know, I don't know if that's true or not, but I don't believe he was in any kissing mood that morning in the second year of his reign in 602 B.C. Because you see, amid all the opulence, amid all the wealth, the success and power that he had, Nebuchadnezzar had a dream that he could not fully remember, much less understand. And you can probably relate to that. You know, you have a dream at night. You wake up in the morning. You know you've had a dream. And you try to remember what it was. You might have some little bits and pieces, but you just can't quite put it together. Well, I don't think that you ever did what he did. You never went to the extent that he did. He was determined that he would not be satisfied until, until he discovered the meaning and the application. See, the Babylonians believed that the gods spoke to humans through dreams. And so they placed a lot of confidence in those dreams because if the gods would speak to them in dreams, they needed to know what that was because they wanted to know what the gods were telling them. And so the Bible tells us he called together his magicians, his astrologers, his sorcerers, and the Chaldeans, and they asked him to tell him what he had dreamt. Now, in Nebuchadnezzar's dream, as we're going to see, it portrays the rise and fall of empires. It takes us from Daniel's day all the way down through the quarters of time to the age that we're living in further predicts what will take place in the future of planet Earth. And so the king called for his most educated men. There was fortune tellers, astrologers, psychics, and so forth, the so-called wise men of Babylon. This was the intelligentsia of his kingdom. They were on the royal payroll, in a matter of fact. They were like the kind of like the, the president's cabinet that we would have in this, in this country. They were to advise the president and guide him as to as the decisions that he was to make. Now, he makes a strange demand in verse, beginning in verse 3. And the king said to them, I have a dream, and my spirit is anxious to know the dream. And they answered him. They said, O king, live forever. Tell your servants a dream, and we will give the interpretation. The problem was Nebuchadnezzar couldn't remember the dream. And so the wise men claim now, they claim they had direct communication with the gods. So connect the dots. The wise men have direct communication with the gods. The God speaks to Nebuchadnezzar through a dream. Therefore, all the wise men should have to do is ask the gods, right? And they should be able to tell them what the dream is. It seemed pretty simple to Nebuchadnezzar. Now, don't forget, they believe these dreams originated with the gods, that there are messages from them. So Nebuchadnezzar tells me, he says, therefore, tell me the dream, and I shall know that you can give me its interpretation. And so he's putting a test to him. He says, listen, you guys are on the, on the royal payroll here. You should be able to tell me what the dream is and give me that. That way I know what you're going to tell me it means. I can trust that. Because he knows if they can't tell him that, then he can't trust the interpretation. Well, these guys are in trouble. You know, they've been on the royal payroll for a long time, and they know that they're in trouble. 
and it's going to get worse before he gets better. And the king says, nothing doing. He gets fur furious. And they answer by saying, tell us what you dreamed and we'll interpret. In verse 10, the Chaldeans answered the king and said, there is not a man on earth who can tell the king's dream. You know what they just did? The gig is up. We just blew it. You just, you, know, <laughs> you found out what we're about. But the king is dead serious, and he's not about to back off. So he issues a death decree. And he says, take him out. He says, look, I'm paying you guys a good salary. Your heads are going to roll. And he sends out the, the word to execute all the wise men. And as this decree was issued, Daniel goes in and requests of Nebuchadnezzar time to ask God for help. And Daniel prayed earnestly to God for, to reveal the king's dream and its meaning. And God answered his prayer. And you know, folks, he'll answer yours too. But we must come in humble faith and believe like Daniel. Well, Daniel was overwhelmed by this amazing revelation of God's mind and purpose, especially with its tremendous implications for the future. And so he thanks the God of heaven. Look at verse 23. He says, I thank you and praise you, O God of my fathers. You have given me wisdom and might and have now made known to me what we asked of you, for you have made known to us the king's demand. And shortly after this, Daniel is brought into the throne room of King Nebuchadnezzar, and Daniel comes face to face with his greatest ruler of ancient times. In verse 27, Daniel answered in the presence of the king and said, The secret which a king has demanded, the wise men, the astrologers, the magicians, and the soothsayers cannot declare to the king. Notice what he referred to in that? These wise men. And friends, listen, the very same thing could be said today concerning all these you know, new age channelers and spiritualists and stuff. Folks, listen, God is not pleased with this. In fact, it provokes him. Now let's go to verse 28. He says, they couldn't do it, but he says, but there is a God in heaven who reveals secrets and he has made known to King Nebuchadnezzar what will be in the latter days. And so he points Nebuchadnezzar to who? To himself? No, he points him to the God of heaven. And folks, listen, that's where we need to look. So let's take a look at, at, the, at the dream here, beginning in verse 31. He says, you, O king, were watching, and behold, a great image. This great image, whose splendor was excellent, stood before you, and its form was awesome. This image's head was of fine gold, its chest and arms of silver, its belly and thighs of bronze, its legs of iron, its feet partly of iron and partly of clay. You watched while a stone was cut out without hands, which struck the image on its feet of iron and clay and broke them in pieces. Then the iron, the clay, the bronze, the silver, and the gold were crushed together and became like chaff from the summer threshing floors. The wind carried them away so that no trace of them was found, and a stone which struck the image became a great mountain and filled the whole earth. And so here he tells Nebuchadnezzar of this great metallic image of gold and silver and bronze and iron, and then finally feet of iron and clay. Now, you know, as I, I kind of, when I'm reading through my Bible, I kind of like to imagine that I'm there. You know, actually, I'm like I'm a fly on the wall observing what's going on. And I can see that Nebuchadnezzar is there, and here comes this young Jewish boy, comes in there, and he's telling him exactly what he saw in a dream. And I think by this time, Nebuchadnezzar slid right to the very edge of his, his throne. He's looking at Daniel. He says, Daniel, you've got it. That's exactly what I saw. Now, at this point, I want to introduce some vital principles in understanding prophecy. There are three basic steps to follow. Number one, <clears throat> read the prophecy. Just read the prophecy. Now, I know that's simple, and it, and it is. We need to keep it that way. But you see, there is much misunderstanding today because we read what someone said or wrote or preached about the prophecy. We will never get the true understanding for ourselves unless we do what? We read it for ourselves. That's right. Revelation chapter 1 and verse 3 says, Blessed is he who does what? Who reads the words of this prophecy and keeps those things which are written in it, for the time is near. And of course, we saw earlier in Matthew chapter 24 and verse 15, where it says, Spoken of by Daniel the prophet, whoever reads, let him understand. So we must read to understand. Now, there's a principle I want to share with you right now. You may want to write this down. And it's, it's very simple. <clears throat> If you want to know what the Bible means, you must first know what the Bible says. Okay? I'm going to tell you why I'm telling you that, why I'm sharing that with you now. <clears throat> I have the Bible misquoted to me probably more than anything. Because what happens is we will read it 
And instead of reading what it says, we will read what we want it to say. You follow me? It happens all the time. It happens all the time. That's why three people can be watching a program and three people see three different things taking place. And so if you want to know what the Bible means, you must first know what does the Bible actually say? What does the Bible actually say? Number two, we must discover the biblical interpretation of the prophecy. Not Tom Michalski's or some churches. What does the Bible say? Actually, that's one of the principles that got me really hooked on studying the Bible. I began really studying the Bible in 1979. I was a young man. Um, I'll tell you more about my life on another night, but <clears throat> I, we, I'd just gotten married, and, and my whole life was really taking a change for the better. Um, you know, they say behind every good man there's a woman. Boy, I tell you what, I can testify to that. That was a mess back then. But I started studying the Bible, and until I started looking at it and seeing how the Bible actually explains itself if you give it a chance. The Bible is its best own commentary. It's not a commentary some guy wrote. Look at the commentary that the author of the Bible wrote, and it's a lot, it's a lot better. You see, it really doesn't matter what I personally think, or for that matter, what you personally think either, or some writer thinks. You know, let's, let's say, I would say, well, what do you personally think that this means? And we went around the room, we asked every person, I want you, you know, you say what it means, you say what it means, you say what it means. Who's to say who's right or who is wrong? You see, when we study the Bible, we need to turn to the Bible itself. In fact, God instructs us to do that. Now, step number three, <clears throat> find out how the interpretation that God gives is fulfilled in history. Much of Bible prophecy was history written in advance. So you can look back on history to see, was this fulfilled the way the Bible said? And that gives us confidence then in the, in the prophecy. So we've read the prophecy. Let's discover the Bible's interpretation and historical fulfillment. Daniel says in verse 36, he says, this is the dream. Now we will tell the interpretation of it before the king. He said, you, O king, are a king of kings, for the God of heaven has given you a kingdom, power, strength, and glory. You are this head of gold. Let me ask you a question. Did Daniel define that head of gold? Absolutely. So is there any reason to look any other place for another interpretation of it? You know why I'm telling you that? Because that happens all the time. That happens all the time. Daniel told me, he says, you are this head of gold. Your kingdom is represented by this head of gold. And folks, listen, that is a very, very accurate picture of the first world empire. That's head of gold representing Babylon, the golden city. It was a mighty metro of antiquity. It had walls 200 feet high. It was considered absolutely impregnable. The, the river Euphrates flowed right through the center of it. The walls were so wide that it was said they could hold chariot races on the tops of the walls. And like I say, it was, they had years of food stored up inside. The Euphrates River flowed through. They could defend against any siege because no army could supply their army long enough to starve them out. Like I said, now Babylon was 10 miles around, Rome was six, Athens was four. It was a very large city. In fact, archaeology confirms the greatness of the kingdom of Babylon. This is from a letter from Nebuchadnezzar himself. He says, the whole earth is what? Prostrate at her feet. That's right. Everybody was in subservience around there to them. Now, of course, the, kingdom wanted, the king wanted his kingdom to last forever. This was ambition. But his prophecy tells us that it was not going to happen that way. God says, nope, another kingdom's going to rise. Now, Babylon ruled the world from 605 to 539 B.C., but Babylon passed away, and Medo-Persia became the second world empire. Daniel said in verse 39, he says, but after you shall arise another kingdom inferior to yours. You know, at the time that Nebuchadnezzar had this dream, he was secure as a world leader. In fact, there was no reason for him to suspect that it would not always be so. But he was overthrown by the kingdom represented in Daniel verse th chapter 2, verse 32, as a chest and arms of silver. And then as today, silver is inferior to gold. Gold is worth somewhere around $1,900. Silver is worth about twenty-five. dollars Now, just a few pages ahead in your Bible in Daniel chapter 5 and verse 28, the next world ruling power is referred to as the Medes and the Persians. <clears throat> Verse 28, 
He says, Peres, your kingdom has been divided and given to the Medes and the Persians. Again, a fitting symbol, the two arms joined at the chest to show the two kingdoms. The Medes and the Persians actually joined their forces together in order to overthrow Babylon. An interesting thing is that the Persians, you know how they collected their taxes? You know, everybody collects taxes. Every, every, every nation, every kingdom, they all collect taxes, but they collected them in silver. In silver. Babylon, they said gold was so plentiful, it was just like it was all over in the streets. <clears throat> The Medes and the Persians ruled from 539 B.C. to 331 B.C. when the Greeks defeated them at the Battle of Arbella. You see, folks, this is not a human book. This is a divine book. It accurately predicts the rise and fall of mighty empires. In fact, the Bible even named Cyrus the general who overthrew the Babylonians 150 years before he was born. Let's go see what the prophet Isaiah says in Isaiah chapter 45 and verse 1. He says, Thus says the Lord to his anointed, to Cyrus, whose right hand I have held, to subdue nations before him, to loose the armor of kings, to open before him the double doors, so that the gates will not be shut. And so here the, the prophet tells us not only only who, but how Babylon would fall. Now, he notice he mentions the double doors, that the gates would not be shut. Let's take a look at some history. Now, see, on that fateful night as the Babylons were thrown this drunken party, actually in defiance against the Medes and the Persians who had laid siege to the city. In fact, prior to that, they were throwing baskets of food down at the Persians, just taunting them. He says, man, what are you guys doing? There's no way that you can starve us out of here. And so Belshazzar, who was the second ruler of the kingdom, he was ruling in the, king, in the city of Babylon. He threw a big party for his, uh, for his lords. And during that party, because they took the, the articles that were taken from the temple in Jerusalem, and they were drinking out of those def defacing or, uh, you know, sacrilege against them, a bloodless hand appeared and began writing on the wall. And wrote the words that's recorded in verse 28. He says, Meanie, God has numbered your kingdom and finished it. Tekel, you have been weighed in the balances and found wanting. Peris, your kingdom has been divided and given to the Medes and the Persians. You guys ever hear the, the saying, can't you read the handwriting on the wall? That's where it comes from. It comes from Daniel chapter 5. <clears throat> While the Babylonians were sitting there partying, Cyrus what he did was they dug an alternate channel. They diverted the Euphrates River out of its path into a dry lake bed and he marched his army right under the walls of the city. The problem is there were still gates inside that would have kept them out of the city. So what would have happened? They would have marched in one side and marched right outside the other. But as God promised, those two leave gates were going to be open. And the arrogant confidence that Babylonians had left the inside gates open, or maybe they had a spy in there that did it. And while they partied the night away, in all the confidence that nothing could ever happen to them, their world as they had known it came to an abrupt end. In fact, these facts are widely known and documented. I'm going to show you a little video clip from an educational history film. <clears throat> I think I got it. Volume. Maybe we're not going to have volume. That's okay. That what the history film said, what I just got done telling you, but I just wanted to show you that I'm not just making this stuff up. <clears throat> Again, archaeology confirms a biblical account with the Cyrus Cylinder. That's, a, that's an actual photograph of the Cyrus Cylinder. And there he describes in detail how they overthrew the city of Babylon. You see, God's word is reliable. It foretells the future. Well, let's continue on now with the king's dream in, in verse 39 of Daniel chapter 2. It says, Then another, a third kingdom of bronze, which shall rule over all the earth. Further along in the sequential prophecies of Daniel in, in Daniel chapter 8 and verse 21, it tells us which kingdom this represents. <clears throat> he says in verse 21 of chapter 8, And the male goat is a kingdom of who? of Greece, the large horn that is between its eyes, is the first king. Who was the first king of, of Greece that went and conquered all over the place? Alexander the Great. Do you know that military um, tacticians still study what Alexander did? They still study what he did. It's amazing. Everyone knows about that. Once again, we have another very appropriate representation. The Greek army was led by Alexander. He was a very young man, by the way. He marched his men something like 11,000 miles, conquering almost all the then known world before he died of a combination of malarial fever <clears throat> and alcohol poisoning. I was listening to a podcast. I love history. 
I love history. You know, I hated history when I was young. But once I started studying the Bible, and I re realized that there's a bigger force at play in this whole thing. Man, history just came alive to me. Man, as I was listening to all this, this podcast uh, on, on Alexander, <clears throat> and they really believe now that his four generals, they actually conspired against him, and they poisoned him. Now, for years, they thought that he was, that it was just malarial fever and alcohol poison because he, he drank uh, way, way, way too much. Uh, but he died at the age of 33. And history confirms his greatness. Many of you may have seen the, 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 uh, the movie or the History Channel special on his great general of antiquity. But what was it that Alexander's men wore in the battle? They had bronze breastplates, bronze helmets, bronze shields, bronze swords. That was the metal that they used. And so bronze was very fitting for that. Um, Historical Library, book 16, chapter 12 says, I am persuaded that there was no nation, city, nor people where his name did not reach. There seems to have been some divine hand presiding both over his birth and actions. Once again, God chose a fitting metaphor to describe the kingdom that would rule the world from 331 B.C. to 168 B.C. But the kingdom doesn't, or the history doesn't end with this third kingdom. Greece did not rule the world forever. Now, the fourth world kingdom was the Roman Empire, represented in the dream by the legs of iron of the metal man. Verse 40 <clears throat> He says, finally, there will be a fourth kingdom, strong as iron. Now, you don't have to have a master's degree in history to know that the Roman Empire is the fourth world kingdom represented by the legs of iron. Rome ruled from 168 B.C. to 476 A.D. In fact, so exactly did Daniel's portrayal correspond to its historical fulfillment that the great English historian Edward Gibbon uses the Bible's prophetic language. Though not necessarily a Christian or a Bible believer himself, and whether he did it intentionally or not, he used scriptural language in his monumental history on the decline and fall of the Roman Empire when he wrote this. The images of gold, of silver, or brass that might serve to represent the nations and their kings were successively broken by the iron monarchy of Rome. And so Roman Empire, this fourth uh, world kingdom, ruled from 168 to 476. Now, <clears throat> I want to say something here before I go on any further. When the Bible talks about that world kingdom, it's talking about a world kingdom in relationship to those who hold the oracles of God. There are other kingdoms. You had the Chinese, you had the Aztecs, the Mayas in, in South America. You know, there were, there were other kingdoms, but the ones who had direct contact or direct control over those who've been entrusted with the oracles of God is what they're talking about as a world empire. You know, world history had reached the legs of iron when Jesus was born and lived some 2,000 years ago. In fact, by the time Jesus was born, most of the then known world was under Roman rule. In fact, you may remember that Joseph and Mary were on their way to Bethlehem. Why? Pay their taxes, right? Caesar Augustus had took a census. It was about paying taxes when Jesus was born. And just as the legs are the, form the longest part of the body, Rome had the longest reign of any of the other world powers. But little by little, Rome rose to power, fought many wars and enslaving many people. Rome ruled with an iron fist. Uh, if you ever read about Rome and what they did, I was reading an account <clears throat> where Julius Caesar, everybody's, just about everybody's heard about Julius Caesar. Caesar was, I mean, just a brute. I mean, he really was. He, he went up to a city, you know, he went and conquered a lot. He became wealthy because when they conquered a people, they enslaved them. They just took them all as slaves and they would take them out to another part of the kingdom. They would sell them off. And he sold millions and millions of people as slaves. But he would go up to a city and he would ask them to surrender. And when they didn't surrender, they went in, they stormed it, they killed every man, woman, and child. Nobody survived. So when they went to the next city and they told them to surrender, you know what they thought? Better to be a slave and alive than to be dead like the last ones and just getting our bones bleached out in the sun. They ruled with an iron fist. They had a very, very strong, strong kingdom. Um, and this was foreseen in the king's dream. But Rome, as a great kingdom, world kingdom, was also going to come to an end. I want you to notice what happens to Rome, though, because it's not like the others. Let's go to verse 41. <clears throat> Daniel says, whereas you saw the feet and toes, partly of potter's clay and partly of iron, the kingdom shall be what? It'll be divided. And so God foretold that the, the Roman Empire would not be conquered, but they would fall apart and come to an end. 
In fact, God accurately predicted ancient Rome would not be followed by a fifth world empire. And so the toes of the image, now in a normal person, how many toes do they have? They have 10, that's right. And so the breakup of Rome it resulted in 10 nations that rose out of the ashes of Rome. Those 10 nations are the, the Anglo-Saxons, the Franks, the Suevi, the Visigoths, the Burgundians, the Alamanni, the Lombards, the uh, Vandals, the Hurrili, and the Ostrogoths. And these would eventually become the nations of Europe. Now, 10 is not a coincidence. You see, the God of the Bible looked down through the age of history and he foresaw this division of 10. Now, those three that are extinct, we'll talk about those on another night because three of those uh, nations were completely obliterated, completely blotted out. There's no remnant of them that we know of today. <clears throat> and so the Bible predicted that these 10 nations as represented by the 10 toes on the feet of iron and clay. But never, never again will they ever unite into a single empire. You see, because this is not the end of the vision. <clears throat> There's more to come. Here's some powerful words of prophecy. Verse 43, Daniel says, he says, As you saw iron mixed with ceramic clay, they will mingle with the seed of men, but they will not adhere to one another, just as iron does not mix with miry clay. You know, throughout the centuries, military leaders and kings and emperors have wanted to unite Europe and they have tried to do that and put that Roman Empire back together. Many talented men have tried to unite Europe, but each one in turn has been defeated by God. I want you to notice how the New Living Translation puts us. <clears throat> he says, this mixture of iron and clay also shows that these kingdoms will try to strengthen themselves by forming, forming alliances with each other through what? Through intermarriage. But they will not adhere to one another just as iron does not mix with clay. The Bible says they will not adhere to one another. Folks, listen, those seven words, those seven words have stopped some of the most powerful men in history right in their tracks. Men like Charlemagne, Napoleon, Kaiser Wilhelm, Mussolini, Adolf Hitler, they all tried and failed. And folks, listen, anyone else who tries, they will fail as well because the Bible says they shall not cleave one to another. Now, I want you to notice that the emphasis put on marital alliances. In the New Living Translation, it says, forming alliances with each other through intermarriage. You know, at one time, almost all of the royal courts of Europe had intermarried in order to try to bring Europe together and to stop the fighting that had been going on. The Fredericksburg Castle in Denmark tells about that, helps actually confirm the Bible's accuracy. Inside this castle, there are wall hangings and tapestries that reveal how people tried to unite Europe through intermarriage. There's a picture painted on the wall shows the family tree of King Frederick and Queen Diana. And if you, if you, I don't think I have one in there. I don't have, yeah, you can see it bigger up there. And it shows how they're all branching out and they're all connected together. When um, uh, the czar, the last czar of Russia, I think it was Nicholas, when he and his family were killed, they were actually related to those in England. And England was thinking about bringing them out of there so that they would be safe, but they didn't move quick enough. But this shows all the various unions through the years and man's failed attempt to defeat the prophetic word of God. As I mentioned, great leaders have tried as well. There was Napoleon. You know, Napoleon was thought to be unstoppable. And he was doing very well until he met his Waterloo. And I want you to notice what history records about this battle. He says, what was the principal adver adversary of this tremendous power? By whom was it checked and resisted and put down? By none and by nothing but the direct and manifest interposition of God. When Napoleon was getting ready to, to make war with Wellington at Waterloo, the people in England thought it was over. They were selling everything for nothing because they thought everything was going to come under France's rule. And when it, the word came back that Wellington was, uh, was successful in defeating Napoleon, it was just absolutely amazing. In fact, I heard of a, of a computer that was used to, you know, you put all the information of a battle in, and then it will determine who is most likely to win. And when they put everything that Wellington had, they put everything that, that Napoleon had, it came back, Napoleon cannot lose. But you know what? Lord had a rainstorm happen that day. 
And Wellington, or Napoleon got mired down in the mud, couldn't get his cannons in place. And Wellington, the English troops, defeated the French on that day. <clears throat> These are nine uh, European monarchs who attended the funeral of Edward VII. This was photographed at Windsor Castle on the 20th of May, 1910. They're all there because they're all relatives. They're all, they're all connected to each other. This is George V and Nicholas II in Berlin in 1913. This is just prior, prior to World War I, okay? Now, what do you notice about those two? Do they look related? Yeah, they look like they could be brothers, don't they? <clears throat> Here's a picture, another picture of the monarchies of, uh, of Europe. The story is told about a Christian nurse who was serving Adolf Hitler during a very serious uh, illness that he had, and she read to him Daniel Chu. And when he came to these seven words, he jumped out of bed shouting, I will win, I will win. When Paris fell, Napoleon visited Napoleon's tomb, and he scoffed at Napoleon, called him a fool, and he said, I will win where you have failed. You know, if he visited the tomb today, you know what he'd be able to say? Move over. I didn't do any better than you did. They shall not cleave one to another. And then, of course, we have the European Union and Brexit, which is, uh, they thought that would be the, un the undoing of the European Union. You know, the European Union was the latest attempt to unite Europe. And I said, too, at that time that it would fail because the Bible says they shall not cleave one to another. Well, so far, so far, the prophecy has accurately predicted the rise and fall of world empires. So let's go back and look at a very important part of Nebuchadnezzar's dream because here is really the most amazing part of the prophecy. Let's go to verse 34. He says, you watch while a stone was cut out without hands, which struck the image on its feet of iron and clay and broke them in pieces. And a stone that struck the image became a great mountain and filled the whole earth. You see, what, what Daniel and Nebuchadnezzar saw in his dream was planet Earth's grand climax. You see, this ancient prophecy has passed the test of time. See, this rock that is cut out without hands and smote the image and ground it to powder and filled the earth, truly, that represents Christ's soon coming eternal kingdom. Friends, listen, I've got good news for you. The world will soon see Christ's kingdom. Jesus is coming to put an end to all the hunger and starvation and turmoil and conflict that's taking place on his planet. And here's a promise which God will soon fulfill. This is in verse 44. He says, and in the days of these kings, the God of heaven will set up a kingdom which shall, what? Never be destroyed, and the kingdom shall not be left to other people. It shall break in pieces and consume all these kingdoms, and it shall stand for how long? Forever. Now, I've got a video clip coming up. This doesn't have any sound with it, but you'll see this is an artist's idea of what Daniel and Nebuchadnezzar saw in their dream. <clears throat> He said, you saw, O king, a head, of, a head of gold, chest and arms of silver. Those thighs of, of, of bronze, that midsection, and then, of course, the legs of iron and the feet of iron and clay. And he said, while you watched, a stone was cut out without hands, and it smote the image on its feet of iron and clay, and it ground it to powder, and the wind blew it away, away like the chaff from a summer threshing floor. And that rock grew into a mountain, and it filled the whole earth. Friends, listen, that rock was talking about was Jesus Christ. Friends, listen, we're not living in the days of the head of gold or the chest and arms of silver, not the hips of brass or legs of iron, or, uh, but in the toes right down at the end of time. In fact, <clears throat> if someone were to ask me, Tom, where on this image do you think we are? I'd say we're in the very toenails. We're right at the very, very end of time. You remember those first words of Daniel to, uh, to King Nebuchadnezzar that we read in verse 28? Let's read them again. <clears throat> he said, but there is a God in heaven who reveals secrets, and he has made known to King Nebuchadnezzar what will be in the latter days. You see, the most important application of the prophecy is for who? Who's living in the latter days? Yeah, we are. And so God places back then for us today. Now, it was important for the king to understand and to know that God was directing the affairs of men, but it is more applicable to you and me than for that ancient king. So why? Why is it important for you to know about the dream of an ancient king? Simply this. The image in Nebuchadnezzar's dream portrayed the timeline of history all the way from that day all the way down to our day. And once you realize that the Bible can be trusted with the past, 
you will know without a doubt that the Bible can be trusted with the things still to come. And you can prepare for the final, most dynamic event that is portrayed in the prophetic vision. I want you to notice the words of Daniel in verse 45 now. He says, The great God has made known to the king what will come to pass after this. He says, The dream is what? The dream is certain and its interpretation. You know what we would have told him today? King, you can take this one to the bank. This one is solid. This is solid. You know that this is the way it is. Every part of this prophecy has come to pass except for one. History has followed this prophecy like a blueprint, and folks, it will continue to do so. You see, the political workings on this planet are not random. God has been guiding and controlling it all along. And there's only one kingdom that's left that remains to rule the world, and that's God's kingdom. That rock cut out without hands is the one kingdom which will rule forever. In fact, John in Revelation speaks about this coming kingdom in Revelation chapter 11 and verse 15, where he says, Then the seventh angel sounded, and there were loud voices in heaven, saying, The kingdoms of this world have become the kingdoms of our Lord and of his Christ, and he shall reign for how long? Forever and ever. Folks, listen, we can have hope today because tomorrow is in the hands of the same God who has been guiding history from one end of the timeline down to the other. History has played itself out. There is only one kingdom left to be established because soon Jesus Christ, the Messiah, the one who paid such a remarkable visit to this planet 2,000 years ago is going to pay us another visit. And then he is going to set up his eternal kingdom. So my question for you tonight is are you ready for Jesus to come? In Revelation chapter 22 and verse 7, Jesus said, Behold, I'm coming quickly. Blessed is he who keeps the words of the prophecy of this book. You know, above all the roar and confusion of this earth, there sits a God who loves and guides and even controls the affairs of men. Folks, listen, you're not here by accident. I don't believe you were born at this time by accident. I don't believe you're here tonight or listening online by accident. You see, divine prophecy demonstrates that our world is under his control and that our individual lives may sense his controlling and abiding presence. Now, there are five major reasons for prophecy. Five major reasons for prophecy. I'll put them up on the screen here for you. Number one, evidence for the existence of an omnipotent and sovereign God. I have to be honest with you, when I was a young man, I was a wild, crazy young man before I got married. <clears throat> And when I started studying the Bible, when I saw how prophecy is so accurate, I could not deny the existence of God. I had to know that, you know, if God could foretell all this, then I really need to serve him. I need to have him controlling my life, be master of my life as well. Number two, evidence that the Bible is a reliable word of God. You know, prophecy isn't given so much so that we know what the future is, but that we know God knows what the future is. And so we can trust his word as exactly what it is that he's saying. Number three, evidence that the past is explained and the future is foretold. We see the causes and the effects of things that happen all along there and what was going to happen in the future. Number four, unfolds the creator's secrets to have joy forever. How do we have that? You see, when we are resting completely in the Lord Jesus, we don't have to worry about the future. You know, we were just talking about kids, raising kids in today's world. It's a scary thing. It really is. You see what's happening around here. Pastor Myung almost lost his two little girls just, just here a few months ago.